All right, y'all. Saturday night, and I feel like I'm half out of it, to be honest. Um, a good, nice, relaxing day. But at the same time as being relaxing, it was also incredibly busy. But my throat hurts, y'all. My throat is starting to hurt. So I don't know if it's sore from shouting or if it's this ridiculous weather change. But um, I just took two Benadryl and I feel like I could pass smooth out. So here we go. I was reading an Acts. And I'm going to read you my thoughts today and what I wrote down. And then I'm going to do a little little exercise with you. And uh, we'll call it a night because it kind of hurts to talk. So in Acts 23 and 11, we are reading about Paul. Okay, Saul Paul after he was converted. And he had actually been giving his testimony. He asked if he could give his testimony. And they agreed. And he begins giving his testimony. And of course, we know that he gets arrested and all of that. But Acts 23, 11, And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, this was a really low time for Saul, Paul, for Paul, formerly known as Saul. Because he had been scourged, scourged, I don't know how you say it, S-C-O-U-R-G-E-D, scourged, scourged, beaten, imprisoned. He had made a lot of people angry because he had given his testimony about how God had changed him from a Christian murderer to a leader of this group. He then begins a fight between the Sadducees and Pharisees because they put him in there for questioning and they hit him in the mouth when he answers them. And then he comes right back at them and gives, their med gives them a dose of their own medicine. And then he says something to get them to start fighting. He brings up the resurrection because one of those groups that they use the Sadducees, Sadducees or Pharisees, one of the groups does not believe in the resurrection. So he turns them against one another and they begin to fight. And while they're in the middle of bickering, they forget that they were there at one point united to persecute him and maybe even kill him. So they get to fighting and stuff because Paul's not stupid. He's very smart. And they put him in prison. And this is where the scripture takes place. The next night, it says, The Lord stood by Paul and said to him, Be of good cheer. Because just like you just gave your testimony in Jerusalem for me, you're about to have to do that at Rome. And if I'm not mistaken, Paul never makes it out of Rome. But God called him to give his testimony. That's what I want to talk about very briefly. He called Paul. He converted him. And Paul went about preaching this Jesus that had taught him in the desert for three years. That had blinded him with this light. And had shown him the error of his ways. Okay. And then from that point on, his job was to testify to what God had done for him. The miracles he had seen and what God had performed. How God had changed his life. And of you know, baptism, he even says it in Acts 22, I believe, baptism, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus, living a good life, being filled with his spirit. Paul goes about and he starts preaching this doctrine so that everybody else has an opportunity to have an experience like him. And when he's in prison in Jerusalem, I'm pretty I'm sure he's pretty low. He's pretty low because, like I said, he had felt compelled to give his testimony in front of all these people, and he does. I think it spans over a chapter, maybe even two or three chapters. He's talking. He starts from the beginning of his lineage. He starts from where he was uh, learning as a scribe or whatever, and just all the way through and how he held Stephen's clothing while he was stoned. I mean, he goes and gives all the gory details, and then he tells how Jesus converted him. And he gets through all of that, and the people that he's testifying to, they don't respond well. They're angry. Can you imagine giving your testimony of what every, you know, every single thing you've lived and went through and what God had done and brought you out? And people, after listening to you, said, Ugh, I hate you. Let's kill him. Let's stone him. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to listen to his testimony. You wouldn't probably be super urgent or you wouldn't be super joyful or even looking forward to sharing it again. 
if you didn't have a good response. And I studied Paul for a couple years. His missionary journeys were a repeat process of a few believed him and were converted. The rest of them hated him and tried to kill him and kicked him out of town. And he dusted the feet off and he walked to the next town and he redid that process. And I want to say, off the top of my head, I was going to say three years. But I really don't know how many years his um, missionary journeys lasted. It was a long time. But it was a repeat. He testified of Jesus. Told him what he had done for him. Told him what, he, what was possible for him to do for those people. And they either accepted it or rejected it. And they either beat him or tried to kill him or ran him out of town. And he moved on and he repeated that again every city he went to. And he started so many churches. But it wasn't an easy road, guys. And not everybody was happy to see him or wanted to hear what he had to say. But God told him he had to testify. My thoughts on this scripture is, we are called to testify of God's goodness, his mercy, and his works. We are called to testify of how loving and generous and wonderful our God is and how he is ready to forgive and wash people clean of their sins. And we also need to talk to them about what he's done, what his works in our lives. Application, I said, I do not want to hesitate to tell people what God has done for me or what God has delivered me from. I know a lot of people with amazing testimonies that they will never breathe out loud because they're too ashamed of them. But those testimonies are some of the biggest. Well, you know what? Let me finish telling what I wrote down. The connecting scripture, and I like two, so there's a ton of them, but I like these two. Acts 26, 22. So having obtained help, having obtained help from God, I stand to this day. This is Paul testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. In other words, he even was saying, my testimony isn't just about what God's done for me. What happened to me was prophesied about beforehand. And I am just here to tell you that it's true. This is the Messiah. And this is how I know. And this is what he did for me. So he says, I'm not even testifying just about myself. My testimony lines up with prophets and the prophetic word and what was already said and done and written down. And then Revelation 12 and 11, and they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. There is something incredibly powerful about our testimonies. Okay, I'm not saying that our testimonies supersede scripture or other things like that. But I know some people who make no room and allow nothing for people's personal experience. They'll say, well, if it's not in the Bible, I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about your personal experience because that's based on feelings and emotions. But that's not what the Bible says. It takes a good mixture of all of it. And the Bible does say we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So testimonies have an incredibly important place in our lives. And if there's something I would urge you today to think about is sharing yours. And it's probably going to be more than one. I mean, I'm 37. I have a lot. Okay. And I, I haven't really went out and done a lot in this world. I've lived for God my whole life. But I still have a lot of testimonies and things that are miraculous and things that God protected me from and saved me from. And I need to share that. We should not be ashamed. I understand there's shame and guilt associated with the sins that we were pulled out of or the mistakes that we made. I do. I do understand. But our testimonies are our strength. And when we own them, they empower us and they empower other people. So we don't have to keep being victim to our mistakes. We can take ownership of our mistakes and show others how God shines through our mistakes. Because in our weakness, he is strong. And we give them hope that they have hope. Okay, our testimonies give hope to other people that there is a chance for you to be healed there's a chance for you to be delivered. There's a chance for you to change. And I know that because I was. 
right? I was. I was, the little exercise I was going to do is I didn't premeditate this at all. I was going to try to think of all the things that I could tell you that God had done for me as a testimony. And right now, I'm like, my brain is going, I need to nothing. He's done so much. So I'm just going to blurt out random things that come to my mind because I couldn't tell them all. And these may not seem like a big deal to you, but they're the ones that come to my mind, okay? They're the ones that come to my mind. Uh, January 2007, I actually skipped class at college that day. It was a gray day. It was a cold day and I wanted to go home. I didn't want to go to class. <laughs> My last class of the day, driving home, going 65 miles per hour on the highway. I had a gray gallant. Okay. And the day was gray. It was a very gray day. I go through an intersection. It was still 65. So I was still trucking it going 65. And a white van pulls across the highway right in front of me. It was so quick, so sudden, and so close that I never even touched the brakes. I didn't have time. And I T-boned that white van in the middle of that highway. It knocked me unconscious. And when I woke up, I was hurting a lot. Um, they were in bad shape. And to make a long story short, because I want to tell you more than just that one. When the cop came later, I did go to the hospital. They thought my, my ankle was broken. I had a lot of bruises, cuts, and all of that. You know, and, um, but like later, a couple of days later, when I went to the police officer, police office, police department to get my belongings, like my wallet and stuff, because I really needed it. He told me, he said, ma'am, uh, I just want you to know that I didn't come that day to, I didn't come that day to put you in an ambulance or to help you. I came that day to pick up your body when we heard about that wreck. And I guess they saw the footage from the bank that was right there. He said, um, I didn't come to get your belongings. I came to pick you up in a body bag. And that did a lot to me because I knew that it was really serious and bad. But I walked away with not one broken bone. I walked away with just some bruising. Okay. And so in my mind, I was like, well, I know it was bad. But maybe it wasn't that bad. It was bad enough that I don't know that the other people in the car survived. They took them to a different hospital. And I don't know that they were doing well. And I wasn't at fault, and that's not important. But God saved me that day. And let me tell you how he saved me before that day. He prepared me for that day. I was driving through the same town, and it's known to give speeding tickets and seatbelt tickets. And I had a bad habit of never wearing my seatbelt. I was not wearing my seatbelt. I pulled up to the red light and stopped, and there was a cop right beside me. And I was like, please don't give me a ticket. Please don't give me a ticket. Too late. Cop pulls me over. I think he gives me an inspection sticker ticket and a seatbelt ticket. Okay, that was about a week or two before that wreck happened. The day that wreck happened, I was wearing my seatbelt because I was going through the same town. I wore my seatbelt after that anyway because I didn't want to pay for any more tickets. I was broke and I was in college. But I was wearing my seatbelt that day because I had gotten a ticket a week or two earlier or I would not have been wearing my seatbelt and I would have went completely through that windshield, guys, and I would be dead today. I would not be here. That was the same month I got pregnant with my first child. As a matter of fact, I might have been pregnant when that wreck happened. We don't know. How devastating. God took care of me twice. He got me a ticket so that I'd slap that seatbelt on. And I obeyed and I wore the seatbelt after that. And even with a seatbelt, they didn't expect me to live. And I walked out of there with nothing, guys. A lot of bruising. That was it. Miraculous. God is a protector. He can protect you. And trust him. Trust him. I, I look back and I thank God for that speeding ticket. I'm telling you I would not be alive today. And I cringe when I think about Because I don't ever think about it until I just said it. I cringe when I think about going through a glass windshield. And into the side of a van at 65 miles an hour. I would not have made it. It would have been so incredibly painful. If I would not have died on impact, it would have been painful. That woman, it was so fast, so close, that I saw the side of her face where I hit. Like when I hit them, all I saw was a flash of white in the side of her face. I can't, I can't imagine. 
All right, I'm gonna hurry because that's just one. There's too many guys, too many to recount. But I'll tell you one more about a car wreck, okay? And I have about four of these. None of them were my fault. <laughs> Me and my brother as kids, we were going to a revival at another church. We were driving down the road going 55, about 55, 60 miles an hour, the speed limit. And we're just chatting. We're having a good day. It's in the afternoon. It's a school night, I think. Going to a local church, another church to worship God. We're chit-chatting, talking, and up ahead I see, we nicknamed it Dead Man's Curve because there were so many car accidents in that curve and so many people died because it's just dangerous. The way that it turns is just dangerous. Not thinking nothing of it. We never had any problems with Dead Man's Curve. We knew it was bad. We always slowed down. Well, I noticed, talking to my brother, I'm looking straight ahead and I'm, I'm talking and talking and he's talking and the closer we get to Dead Man's Curve, he hasn't even started braking yet. He hasn't let off the gas. Well, I didn't say anything. I was like, well, surely he will. So I don't say anything. But by the time we got up to that curve, I realized quickly, Colby wasn't doing anything. He wasn't braking. And I learned, I, I looked at him and he was still talking to me. And he was looking at me, talking to me. He was not looking at the road, talking to me. And he did not realize where we were and how fast he was going. And I hollered his name and I said, Colby. And he turns, and now we're going a, a curve that should only be taken at 15 miles an hour or less, 15, 20 miles an hour. We're doing 60. And our we're going, we're not gonna make this curve. We're either gonna jump the culvert and land into this field, or he's gonna try to make that curve. Neither one of us are wearing seatbelts. It was his old, baby blue pinto made of the heaviest metal ever and colby overcorrects he tries to make that curve to keep us from ramping the road in the culvert and going into this field so he jerks it and when he does we go flipping we flip that car no seat belts on and we land right side up in the ditch and I'm shocked because I remember hitting the ceiling of the, the car, the roof of the car. And it slams back down and Colby is very worried about me. He's concerned, okay. He's like, Jesse, Jesse, are you okay? Jesse, are you okay? Just, and I'm not saying anything. And I think he got later, I know he got really aggravated at me because I, I wouldn't say yes, but I was in shock. I think I was in shock. I didn't say any words. I didn't say anything. I just sat there. He's like, are you okay? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And then he's beginning to get weepy because he knows he's in trouble. <laughs> Sounds bad. We survived, but he, he thinks he's about to get in really big trouble from my dad. And he's worried that I'm not okay because I'm not talking. Although I'm fine. I'm sitting straight up. I'm not, but I'm just not talking. So he hops out of the car and he's a little disoriented and he walks around to the passenger's door and he opens my door to get me out. And we're, we landed in a ditch, and so it's on a slant. And so he goes down to get me, and he hits his head really hard right here across the bar, the door frame. And y'all, this Pinto was made from the 80s. It is metal, metal. This is not that plastic car metal you got now. This is metal. And he bangs his head so hard, reaching down to get me out of that car, that he stumbles backwards. He almost knocked himself out. And that was, that was his only injury from that car wreck. So I get out, we try to flag people down for help. People don't stop for us. I guess they're worried, but we eventually get whatever. I had like one bruise on my whole body and it was on my arm where I had tried to shield myself when I when we were flipping and my arm hit the ceiling of the car and it, I guess it protected my head. I had no other injuries than that. Neither did Colby, nothing. I don't know how we weren't squished in there tight. I don't know how we didn't fly out a window, a windshield. I don't know. I don't know how we didn't break anything. Actually, I do. What am I saying? God is the reason we didn't fly out of any windows or windshields. God is the reason there were no broken bones, no cuts, no bruises. Well, I had like a bruise on my arm. Y'all, I had a bruise on my arm. I flipped, we flipped a vehicle going 60 miles an hour in like a 15 mile an hour curve called Dead Man's Curve. 
The list goes on and on and on. I told you about two car accidents. I probably have a hundred instances where God has saved my life. And you better believe I'm going to tell my testimony. And I'm going to tell people, God is a protector. And I know that because he kept his angels and his protective hand on me in multiple bad car accidents. I'm um, over time. My exercise was I was going to try to name you like 10 different testimonies, not talk about them, just name them. But I can't, I can't name them without telling you the story. So for that, I'm sorry, but I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and I'm not ashamed of my testimony. And maybe I'll share some more this week. Maybe a follow up. I don't know. You can let me know if you want to hear any more. There's a ton of them, but God is still God in accidents. And our testimony is our strength. And maybe the ones I gave you today are not something I'd be ashamed of. But I have some of those too. <clears throat> and when the time is right, I'll share them. I don't mind. I'll share them with you. I just don't have time today. Happy Saturday. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I hope you've spent it with your family and people that you love. I know I have. And it's been pretty amazing. I'll see you tomorrow. Give me your heart, give me your song, sing it with all your might. Come to the fountain and you can be satisfied. There is a peace, there is a love, you can get lost inside. Come to the fountain and let me hear you testify into the